And our second speaker today is uh, Lena Ting, who is a, uh, uh, a professor in the Wallace Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory and Georgia Tech, and in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, uh, Division of Physical Therapy. She is also uh, co-director of the Georgia Tech Neural Engineering Center, and is training faculty in Emory Neuroscience Graduate Program, Georgia Tech Mechanical Engineering, Robotics, Bioengineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and uh, Applied Physiology PhD programs. Uh, she has received numerous honors, uh, most recently being named a, a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineers, uh, with publications in journals like uh, Nature Neuroscience, Journal of Neurophysiology, Neuron, plus Computational Biology. Uh, her research program is at the forefront of the nascent area of neuromechanics and uh, pioneers new understanding of how movement and tension translates into action through the complex interplay between the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system. Uh, by drawing on neuroscience, biomechanics, rehabilitation, robotics, and physiology, her group discovered new principles of human movement. And she will be speaking to us today about sensory motor control of balance from flamingos to dancers. Mark? Thank you. Uh, all right, thanks for inviting me. I um, felt that by the title I had to include the flamingos because it's the only thing I've done really in the wild. But I hope to convince you that we're trying to bring the wild into the lab uh, and maybe get back out into the wild. So, um, uh, so you know, my lab is focused on studying balance control in many different ways. Um, but balance for me is a model of basically brain and body interactions uh, that are principles that expand to other types of movements and also, I think, reveal some common principles between cognition and movement. So these are the types of things that I'll be talking about today. Um, we, we have a moving platform that we've done on, you know, to people in the lab. We have simulations and we, I'll, I'll talk about the flamingo. And here we have dancers walking across a beam. These are experts from uh, associated with the Atlanta Ballet. And then these are probably Georgia Tech students doing this kind of movement. So these are, these are the types of movements that we've been studying in the lab and trying to understand better. Um, OK, so, so I'm really interested in, in how, what determines how we move. Um, and at this intersection of, of neuroscience and biomechanics, and just to give you some historical perspective, neuroscientists have generally said, oh, we have a brain, and it just controls how the body moves. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as a measure of this, people will do experiments we're looking solely at neural activity and saying that you, your brain tells your brain stem and then activates your cortex to actually move the muscles in these rhythmic patterns. Um, and so that's one way of thinking about it, but it ignores the body. Uh, my background's actually in, this is really loud, in, uh -huh, in uh, mechanical engineering. And so I came from the opposite perspective, which is to say that, well, we need to know something about the mechanics of the body, and maybe that will tell us what the brain actually needs to do versus doesn't need to do. And, and this perspective really came from uh, these these walking machines that don't have any muscles or actuators on them. And so this is a device that sort of has the physics of a body and is slowly walking down a ramp, and it's extremely energy efficient. Um, and so I thought, well, if we just understand uh, the, the muscles, the tissues, and the environments, then really maybe the brain doesn't have to do anything. It just says, all right, go for it. Now, I, I, this was done, uh, this, this work was done in Andy Ruina's lab, and he said, you know, mechanics is hard and neural control is trivial. And what he meant by that, uh, and he said, therefore, not interesting, he says, what he meant by that was that uh, there's lots of different ways that you can add some control to this thing to make it a little more stable. The thing that they don't show you, well, actually, there is a video, this is Steve Collins, uh, where the thing falls down, and mostly it falls down. Um, so you get, you're seeing the one magical trial uh, in which th it, it works. And so, so there's, a, there's a role for the nervous system there in, in sort of taking advantage of these dynamics to allow us to walk efficiently. So, but he, he said this problem is not interesting because like it's 
not hard. You just you can do it this way, you can do it the other way. And I said, yeah, that's actually to me the most interesting part because like even if we had the same biomechanics and I met your evil doppelganger, I could probably tell who you were without seeing your face and you know as you're walking across the quad. And so um, Andy has now changed his mind. He actually thinks control is super interesting. But at the time, he, he, he said, I'm going to show you something. I want to show you something. It's going to change your life. Uh, he showed me some work by Karen Liu, who uh, is in, now in computer science at um, Georgia Tech, where they were actually able to do, oh, so let's see. I, I'm giving the wrong talk. So they were actually able to simulate these sort of characteristics of people moving. Um, so they would record them in the lab, and then we'd get some parameters out of it, and then we'd simulate this avatar doing different movements that weren't recorded, and it captured the sort of style of movement. And, um, and so I think that's sort of the idea that, that's like really driving my question. I'm going to show you this video, hopefully. Oh yeah, we're having video problems. Let me see if I can go here. And, and so these, these data were recorded without carrying a suitcase. And then um, these, these are synthesized movements with the suitcase, which showed how somebody would walk in a, in a happy <laughs> or a neutral or a sad style. And so it seems like she captured some essence of how you control your body, whether you're carrying a suitcase or not, that sort of generalizes across conditions. And that's something that I'm really interested in. And this involves sort of tuning both um, the sort of commands coming from the nervous system as well as the physics of the body. And that's sort of the interaction, I think if I go backwards here, no, then I, uh, of the interaction of the um, sort of neural control and the mechanics that, you know, we're really interested in. And the thing that's super interesting about this interaction is that we are, we are plastic. So uh, what we do in our lives will shape the interaction between the neural system and the mechanical system in shaping how we actually you know, personally uh, control our bodies in, in movement. So, um, you know, what I think there are this sort of continuum of solutions where there might be some s ways that we can actually move, some that rely more on what I call mechanical computation, so what's, what are the physics of my body, and some that rely more on neural computation, so feedback, sensory feedback, and actually precise control of the muscles and sort of there's two ends of it, um, you know, across, across species. Here is a cockroach. I worked in this lab on cockroaches where you uh, perturb the cockroach with a piece of gunpowder. Um, and it turns out that it can stabilize itself without any kind of reflex because the reflexes in the cockroach are actually really slow. But this sort of highlights the idea that you could have a mechanically smart system that would keep you balanced. And on the other end, I'm going to talk about the dancers where we can think about standing on one leg um, and we're not really able to do this without uh, really having precise sensory motor control. Okay, so I think I need to go forward now. Okay, so each of us within all of the possible ways we could control our body, we pick our own way and can we see that, right? Um, all right, so Again, most of the things I'm going to talk about are in the context of balance control. This is just sort of a summary of the way I think about uh, if, I, if I move the platform here, the, the, it stretches muscles, muscles have a property, I get reflexes from the spinal cord, I get balance correcting responses in the brainstem, and I have sort of a, a response uh, in the cortex that uh, sort of causes a later kind of balance correction. And we're uh, broadly interested in the integration of all of these types of uh, uh, mechanisms um, starting from the outside in. And so this is sort of an outline of my talk. I'm going to talk to you about different be, uh, balance behaviors across this sort of spectrum to show you how, di how diverse they are across people and across species even. So um, I'm going to start here. This is more fun. but And it also shows an extreme of an animal that uses mechanical, what I call mechanical computation, which means that it doesn't require a lot of neural activity, it's fast, but you can't really change how you, how you move, um, and it's sort of tolerant to these sort of uncertainties. Um, so one of the, um, and then on the other hand, so, so that means that, so the way I break it down 
is into these pieces of the first thing is like, what's my postural configuration? If I just make that device, how stable is it, right? So that device is super unstable. Um, you can add a little bit of muscle activity here, and it might make me a little more stable, right? So my muscles are springy, um, and so that means when I push my body, instead of crumpling to the ground, it has a little bit of resistance, and I can tune that based on how I activate my muscles. And then over here, with the neural computation, it's uh, that I actually have to sense what is happening, interpret all of the sensory information coming in, and then generate a response. And so that's going to be really specific to sort of which way I'm falling. So that's the ball here, sort of falling. And here it's, it's sort of, it takes a long time to travel through my nervous system. Um, I have to kind of learn how to translate these signals, and, but it might be efficient, more efficient than turning on all my muscles all the time um, if I, I know how to do that. So you think about if you're learning how to ski, you're going to start by turning on all your muscles and then you're going to turn them down as you learn how to process that information. So, um, all right, on to the flingo. So we, so we actually, this project um, started because we, the, there's a test clinically where people stand on one leg and that is an indication of their balance ability. And uh, we were with Young Hee Chang here from Georgia Tech and saying, well, you know, what's the most extreme example of that? How do flamingos do it? And uh, we have no idea. So he said, let's, let's find out. He studied a lot of different types of animals. And he was able to get us uh, into, uh, to collectively, we got ourselves into Zoo Atlanta to actually look at uh, the, the baby flamingos. They wouldn't let us touch the adult flamingos because they're uh, not used to interacting with people. Um, and, and surprisingly, this guy here, he's the bird curator, and his name is James Balance. <laughs> um, so we went in to, uh, and, and here is a force plate, so we're able to measure the motions of the forces which reflect the, the sway of the body of the animal while they're standing. And so we were, you know, at the time asking, like, how, what are they doing? Are they, how much correction do they need? And so this is uh, a video, here I might want the volume here, of a, about a three-week-old, I think, flamingo. Um, this is after they eat. And so we get them in here after they eat, and they have this sort of postprandial kind of sleepiness, and it will uh, start to fall asleep. Um, there it goes. And it eyes, his eyes start to close. And uh, This video continues for 20 minutes before it puts its leg down. And um, we were not able to say that they sleep because we didn't have EEG and all that stuff. So we had actually had it in the paper and they made us take it out. So, <laughs> like, okay, it eyes is closed. It kind of looks like it's <laughs> sleeping. So here, here is like, I'm going to say asleep, but it was quiescent in our paper. And so um, let's start at the bottom when it's alert and moving. This is a picture of the foot. This is a picture of where the force was um, and how much it moves around on the bottom of your foot. So if I'm doing tree pose, it's moving a lot. Um, and then this is the sort of displacement and the velocity of that. So you can see all the corrections that are being made. Um, and so here, um, the, the center of pressure is moving within like a 10 millimeter area when it's kind of moving around with its friend. And then as it gets kind of slower, you can see that this ball is getting smaller. And then as it sleeps, it actually it gets really small. It shifts right under that leg. And so it's actually really just like a, a, a pendulum. And now there's no change in velocity, which means it's really probably not making many active corrections. This is, um, and for comparison, this is the center of pressure under a person's leg on the same scale here. And this is one from a Tai Chi instructor who we had collected in, in the lab. And you can see that they're also smaller, but probably due to neural mm -hmm. activation. So this is where you have to deduce this. We can't actually say that they're not doing anything neural here. OK, so what we realized is then we had to do sort of a anatomical study 
to see whether or not that was a truly passive movement. And we were able to acquire a cadaver from the Birmingham Zoo. Is it supposed to play a video? And um, found some surprising results. It looks like it's playing, but I'm not sure if it's playing. Audrey, we might have the same problem. I swear this is. Um, I think it might. Sometimes it's a coupling with the projector. Um, and we know this projector is a little weird. There, okay, so I, I don't know if I can, we'll just do, play it this way, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we hypothesized there was some passive mechanism, and here's a, a, a flamingo cadaver, and this is actually its thigh that we're holding here, and this is the only point that we're actually stabilizing the body, because we noticed that if we hold it up, when it was lying on the table, we couldn't tell, but we held it up, it kind of slumped right into this position that it's in when it's standing. And so now he's pushing on the front of it to show it's stable, but if you push on the back of it, it's able to un unfold itself. Um, so this is the, the knee right here, and that's the hip. This is the thigh. That's the shank. And then um, this is just to show that the joints aren't actually locked, that if the animal wanted to like escape, it could do so. But it doesn't need any muscle activity to sort of hold itself in this position, which if you imagine, for us, that's like, standing on your toes with your, you know, your thigh horizontal, and uh, um, it takes a lot of effort for us to hold that posture. And, and interestingly, this only works if, the, the, if, from the front view, the leg is sort of angled in as in a one-legged pose. And when you straighten the leg out as if they're putting two legs down, um, this sort of mechanism just sort of falls apart, which suggests that they need more neural control for two-legged stance and one-legged stance. And so our hypothesis is that they um, really don't need a lot of energy. Now they have to just stabilize themselves a little bit like this, but they have really long springy tendons that might help them to do that. So from that, we hypothesized that um, you know, one of the reasons people say, why do flamingos stand on one leg, is that, well, actually, it might be a uh, take less effort to actually do that um, because of their anatomy, and it's in such a way that allows them to kind of run away if they need to. Um, and so, um, yeah, so in, in this uh, system, their body weight sort of is in front of their knee, which kind of pulls their body down. And then we think it engages some interesting mechanisms around the hip, but there seems to be two ball and socket joints that engage in a particular posture and not in others. And so here, you know, the, the flamingos really, when it's asleep, is relying more on their mechanical configuration. But then when it's awake, it's actually having to do a lot more feedback and, and corrections to uh, maintain its balance. OK. Um, great. So then, so they're, they're moving along this spectrum. And we do the same thing, except we're sort of over here, moving along this spectrum, OK? And one of the ways I can show you that is sort of normal variations between people as we give them sort of predictable and unpredictable types of perturbations in the lab. So this is our very simplified model of what a human balance looks like, where we model, the, you know, we pull the rug out from under people, uh, and we model that as just a mass on a stick with a cart. So this is a very classical engineering problem. And if we push the cart with the same acceleration that we push the people, we can um, measure the sort of acceleration, velocity, and the displacement of the body horizontally. So that's how off balance am I? Um, and we hypothesize that those signals are um, sort of uh, monitored by the nervous system, so estimated by the nervous system. So, and it travels through to your brain stem, so that's what this delay is. It takes time for those neural signals to travel up and then back down to the muscles. And the idea is that your, your brain, I've now modeled as these three numbers, which says, how sensitive am I to the acceleration, velocity, and displacement in generating the activation of muscles to counteract that uh, perturbation? And so we're able to then precisely predict the time course of muscle activity 
based on just the sensitivities and then stabilize the body. So the way it sort of looks like in practice is that you know, we push people over, we measure displacement, velocity, and acceleration in a particular direction because muscles are unidirectional and we think this is from muscle spindles that we're, we're now modeling. And it senses an error, so like how far away from the vertical not moving am I? Um, we basically add those curves up with a certain uh, proportion and then simulate them in like a motor neuron. So if it crosses some threshold, then it fires. So this is a muscle activity that's simulated. This is one that's actually measured. Um, and so we can describe these complex patterns uh, with three numbers for each person um, where, uh, let's see, here's a different individual. They have sort of this red is my model and gray are a number of trials of the person trying to maintain their balance. So the way we interpret these, these signals differ from different people. And so we don't want to average these together, right? We'll get some signal that maybe doesn't stabilize your balance and uh, doesn't really describe it. We can now say for each person, we can characterize by three numbers how sensitive they are to acceleration. So if they're really sensitive, they'll have a bigger bump at the beginning. How sensitive they are to velocity, which will keep this plateau out, and how sensitive they are to the position. So like this person's really position sensitive, not too velocity sensitive. This one's probably more velocity sensitive. So that's a way that we can show people how are using a similar principle to maintain their balance, but that these are slightly different sensitivities, which totally makes sense in terms of a neuroscience point of view, where the synaptic strengths for certain signals may be stronger or weaker in another person. Yes. Oh, sorry, this is muscle activity. So this is a muscle activity that we're recording here. Uh, it's electrical activity of your muscles indicating the uh, drive from motor neurons that turn, the, turn them on and allow them to contract and generate force. Sorry, I didn't. It's not force, it's electrical activity uh, generating cross-bridge cycling. We, it, it's not a direct measure of force because the amount of force generated by the muscle depends on the load. So if I open a door and I pull, like whether it's a lot of force or a little force depends on how heavy that door is and how fast I'm moving, right? So it's not a direct translation to force. Um, sorry about that. Maybe I'm going too fast. Um, and so these signals also drive a bunch of different muscles. So these are ones at the ankle and these are ones more at the, the hip and the, and the knee. So there seems to be some common signal based on whole body movement going to multiple muscles to coordinate them. Okay. Here is an experiment where now I'm looking at the same person over time. We bring them in the lab and we do this experiment where here I'm, this indicates a forward perturbation. And the first time they experience it, so a lot of times when people come in the lab, you let them practice and they get used to it. And we're saying, no, these are people who have never been on the platform. We're giving, and, and this platform we see is a probe of their neural response to balance. And um, so red indicates the muscle that I just showed you that's supposed to help them maintain their balance. So I fall backwards and my shin muscle goes on. Uh, red's my model, black is the actual EMG, and then, um, Blue here is the opposite muscle. So uh, that's the, the calf muscle. And it's also going on, but it's not helping me actually move my center of mass back, but we think it stiffens the joints. And so it gives you some stiffness of like, I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to stiffen my joints and that's gonna help me respond to anything that you throw at me, right? So it's our first time. But we do this same perturbation 30 times, at which point our subjects who are there to get their money are like really bored because it's yeah. really boring. It's like, uh. okay, again, so 30 times and they're like, okay, I understand what's going on. This is an experiment. I just want to get out of here. And you can see that their muscle activity has gone down and this antagonist muscle activity has gone away. Okay, so this is like when you're learning to ski and then you realize, oh, I can just relax, right? Then what we do is without warning them, we do perturbation that starts in the same direction and then we reverse it. Um, and so everybody goes, oh my gosh, like I'm gonna take a step. And, and so you start to see that they, they first, and so this is, the, t the time at which we reverse it is exactly, it's 100 milliseconds, which is exactly when this muscle starts turning on, and so it becomes destabilizing, like you, you basically can't turn it off. So 
What they need to do is reduce this first blip now, which they're able to do over 60 trials, and they need to turn on the opposite muscle, which they do, and then as they learn it, they very quickly don't take a step and their, their motions are small again. Um, so you can see that this muscle activity, they, they can't eliminate this entirely because this 100 millisecond response is really a brainstem response. It's involuntary, but we can modulate it. Um, and so now they're getting more efficient here again. And they're like, and this is 60 trials, so they're even more bored. Uh, and then we switch it back to this original perturbation um, so that they did before. And again, they're surprised again because we've changed it. And now you can see that their, the response of this person has changed where they're, okay, they're turning on this muscle, but kind of less than before. And that antagonist muscle is on. And then after 30 trials, it's still on. And I think this is an indication that they don't trust what's going to happen next. So they've really fundamentally changed how they're processing the sensory information and turning it into motor uh, responses based on what, what they expect from the researcher. <laughs> so, uh, but the nice thing is that all of these responses fall within this sensitivity to acceleration, velocity, and displacement. So we found one pathway that people can just turn the gain knobs up and down to uh, adjust themselves to the particular situation they might find them in. So that's, this is sort of the, the variations where I would say when they're coactive, they're more working on this sort of stiffness type of control. And when they're more efficient, they're really saying, I'm going to just turn on the minimum amount of activity that I need. Okay, and it turns out that, and this is useful in Parkinson's disease and other balance impairments where here's, a, here's the same type of figure. Here's a, a healthy person, so their muscle activity is supposed to go on. Balance recovery is there, the opposite muscle is off. In an older adult, we start to see more co-contraction sort of chronically, and it's, this is known, and it might be due to some sensory degradation. It might be due to, to declines in attention or cognitive ability to balance. But in Parkinson's disease, we see this really big antagonist activity. So that means that um, this muscle is fighting that one. So even though they're trying to maintain their balance, it could be that their joints actually don't uh, change angle uh, because they have this abnormal coactivation. And they're extremely stiff when they come in. So that works with uh, how they present. And it turns out that if we, we can characterize this by fitting our model with this sort of uh, sensitivity to acceleration in the wrong direction. Um, and that is larger in people who are frequent fallers than people who don't fall. And so we think there may be some causal relationship here where, where this uh, allow, makes them too stiff, which is characteristic of, of Parkinson's disease. Okay. Shorten that. Oh. Um, and so uh, I, I didn't show you this part, but people with Parkinson's disease actually stand with their feet narrower, and that's probably because their muscle tone and their feedback is super high, and our models show that if you stand narrower, um, you, can, you can tolerate this sort of abnormal overactivity, whereas if you stand with your feet wider, uh, it actually makes you even more unstable. So here we have an overactive feedback and an overactive stiffness that they're actually compensating for by standing narrower, even though that seems like a paradox that they have bad balance, uh, maybe they should stand wider. But theoretically, that doesn't make any sense. They'll, they'll actually throw themselves over. Okay, so we're involved in some rehabilitation trials with uh, Parkinson's disease that involve dance, and we see changes. And the question was, are these changes good or bad? So. Um, in order to answer that, we said, we don't really know what's better for you, but let's look at somebody who we think is really good at doing balance and see if we can learn something about that. Um, and so I had the fortune of having a student who had been training with the Atlanta Ballet as a youth and, and continued, and the Atlanta Ballet does their summer uh, programs, intensive programs, training programs, on Georgia Tech campus, or th and uh, my lab was over there at the time, and so we were able to get them in on the, on the day days off. Um, and so we wanted to know how does muscle coordination change with long-term training um, in, 
in uh, a balance-related activity, and then we would test them in the lab on a task they hadn't actually trained on to look at how generalized that is. So the way we did this, and it's slightly different than what I talked about before, is that first um, we needed to assess their balance, and there isn't a really good way to do this in a healthy population. Uh, so Andrew Soares developed this test where you walk across uh, pro progressively narrower beams, okay, and we just measure like how far you get o over multiple trials. So it's a really nice measure, and and part of it is also that in our novice or non-ballet dancer cohort, some people had really good balance and some people had really bad balance, and we needed to distinguish them as well. So, um, so what we found is that. Indeed, our experts were all really good, maybe crossing the beam 100%. Maybe the worst one was getting 75% across the beam. And our novices here, they really varied a lot. So some of them were able to make it all the way, and some of them could only go halfway. And this is over like 10 trials. So we just measure the total dif distance. Um, interestingly, if we measure their joint angles while they're doing this, so this is the ankle, sorry, knee angle and ankle angle, there isn't a visible difference between the experts and novices in this task. And that's because it's pretty constrained how they have to actually step. And so now we can look deeper into, OK, are there differences in the actual muscle activity patterns that they're using to actually be successful when they are successful? OK? So um, and then. Uh, you know, their, their walking patterns or the walking with over ground without the beam actually look, again, similar between experts and novices, but then different to the beam walking. So uh, in our lab, we've worked a lot on sort of looking at patterns of multiple muscle activation um, in these coordinated modules. So. Uh, the way you think about this is I, if I want to carry it for walking, if I want to do weight acceptance, then I have to coordinate the activity of muscles in the, in the uh, hip, around the knee, and around the ankle in order to do weight acceptance. And in a gait cycle here, that's going to come on right at the onset of stance phase. Um, and then as I want to push off, then it's mostly the ankle muscles coordinated. And as I swing, then it's going to be a different set of muscles. So, our work has shown that these types of modules can be our signatures that are used to sort of control their functional their libraries of action we might think about that people have that are useful for coordinating movement. So we did this analysis on the dancers and um, the non-dancers. Um, so uh, here's my individuality thing. So we, we had originally done this in, in animals, in cats, uh, doing this balance perturbation. And what we showed so is that here are three cats. Here's the forces, force vectors that they generate during standing in red. And um, uh, these are the sort of motor modules associated with generating those force patterns. And you can see that um, they're different across the animals. The, the red bars indicate the set of muscles that was common across the animals. And, um, so here, this is a, the quadricep muscle, so it's an extensor. That's the one that they all have in common, because you basically can't stand up if you turn that on. But there are other muscles, the hamstring muscles here, that are on in different proportions in the different animals. So like I talked about before, this, this animal is very efficient. They, don't, they only turn on the muscle that's necessary. This animal is coactivating, kind of like my Parkinson's patients, but chronically, like all the time, um, being stiffer. Okay, and depending, and this, these patterns are seen across all the different types of movement balance tasks that we've measured in, in these animals. So they seem to be characteristic to each individual, and that's how they, uh, they move, right? Um, and this, this, this graph just says that depending on the direction that we perturb them, they're, they're activating it in a way that loads the leg. So the activation of this muscle pattern is this really the same across animals. And the force that it generates really looks the same. But the pattern that's used is really different. And this one is probably doing more energy. And I don't know which of these. The, the cats have personalities. Some are like nervous and some are not. So 
uh, that, that could be part of it. And, and uh, so this, this has to do with the sort of habitual way that, that we move. And if we look at the, the dancers and the non-dancers, this is a busy graph, but what it shows is that the dancers tend to have more modules than uh, the non-dancers when they're walking across the beam, which means that they maybe have some extra actions that they're able to perform with their body. Um, so that's the number, uh, I didn't do the mo modules. And then the colors here show um, the muscles that we think are actually participating in here. So a lot of these bars cross zero, so we say, okay, those muscles don't really, really belong. And what we notice is that number of muscles within each of these modules, if we compare experts and novices, is actually lower. So the number of muscles is lower, um, and, the, and uh, so this is two ways of, of quantifying that, and that suggests that when a, when a dancer moves, they're, they're activating just those muscles that they need, whereas when uh, a non-dancer moves, they're, they've got a little bit more additional activation that might be sort of there to provide some extra stiffness, stabilizing, and they're using this more sort of mechanical computation. And so, a lot of times people talk to me about, isn't human movement optimal? And I'm like, no, that's, no. It takes a lot of work to be optimal. That's what Olympic athletes and ballet dancers do. We are sloptimal. We're sloppy. <laughs> we're, we're good enough. Um, and the fact that you can find in a healthy person, you know, less precise activity uh, than, than uh, somebody who's really trained for decades sort of says, we're, we're all in this space of just being okay. Um, and the, the other really interesting thing is that these same modules were used not just when they're doing this challenging beam walking task, um, uh, but in the, in the dancers, they are, what am I looking at here? Ah, uh, shared. The dancers, the experts, are using the same modules when they're doing this narrow beam walk and walking over ground for the most part. So to them, it's like no different. In our novices, they're, they're sharing about 50% of the modules. Um, and that just, that means that they're, it's not really the same task to them. So if we compare the novices uh, on a wider beam, then it starts to look like overground walking. Okay. What we take this to mean is that when the dancers are learning a more challenging task, they're refining modules they might, be, they might already have for walking uh, so that they can be used in a more difficult, challenging way, whereas our novices are like, uh, this isn't anything like walking. I'm, I'm going to try something else. Um, but this training, uh, sculpting of these modules sort of extends the range of tasks that could be performed with these particular muscle activation patterns. And by training on this more challenging task, then what it would do, it would change the way you do the easier task, which is walking over ground, which is what we call it backward compatibility, um, which suggests this, is, this could be a basis for why I can tell the football player versus the ballet dancer when they're not actually doing the thing that they have been training in. Right? So that, uh, this is why I can identify you walking across the quad from a distance. Um, all right, so I think learning to walk is then like learning to speak. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you measure vowel sounds, this is one first frequency, second frequency, you can make a map, and this is what uh, all the vowel sounds that are possible that infants sort of say. So this is like ah, and this is ooh, and whatever. Um, and um, so infants can learn languages. But after they train in their native language, this map changes. And so you can see that the, the Swedish people have 14 vowel sounds, and Japanese people have five vowel sounds. And what happens is that they have different sort of modules of phonemes that they both perceive and produce that really shapes their interaction with the world. So I, I take this as a, a, an analogy to the sort of motor accents that we've been looking at, and it turns out if you're Japanese, then all of these sounds sound the same. Um, and if you're Swedish, that's actually four different vowel sounds, and it, it alters your perception as well.
So if a, a motor accent is then sort of like a projection of this, this space onto a different uh, sort of language, it explains why we have these very stereotypical types of accents of French people or Japanese people when they're, when they're speaking English, let's say. It's really formed by these ways so that they conceptualize um, uh, sort of making a, a useful sound. Um, and so we think that these motor accents uh, for movement emerge from sort of the interactions that people have in their, in their lives that what's useful for them. If you're a dancer, what's useful for you is different than if you're a football player. Okay. And in the last few minutes of my slide, I'm going to show a little bit more of our dancer work that's sort of outside the framework of this. But one of the things we're interested in is having robots that uh, sort of help with therapy and provide intuitive ways that people walk. Um, and this is a collaborator where they developed this robot that you, know, you hold it by its hand and it follows you instead of using this game pad, which makes it cognitively less, less diffi difficult to uh, interact with the robot. But our, our interest is to sort of identify principles that would, you know, what's actually going on here that makes it something intuitive to interact with than not. And so um, we're, we're trying to say, okay, can we, can we figure out, study people to figure out what about a robot would make it more intuitive, reduce the training time on developing a robot, um, and it should learn and adapt with the human. And for us personally, it makes the robot a great way, tool for studying humans. Um, let's see. So our approach is, is uh, so this is Madeline Hackney, our collaborator who's developed this adaptive tango dancing for improving gait and balance in people with Parkinson's. And we've done some studies with that. But um, from personally having participated in some of these uh, interventions, it's, it's very true that these force cues at the hand are conveying a lot of information and helping people learn how to walk. We're not moving their legs in a particular pattern, but somehow these cues help them uh, do things that they were not able to do before, and that's something we'd like to harness. Um, and in, in, uh, in this case, we've got identifiable experts and novices, and we sort of have a language of interaction that we can study, because one of the problems is that um, people really haven't studied human-human interactions Partially, you know, we do these things all the time, helping people up, carrying things. But if we study this type of carrying task, we really wouldn't know what's supposed to happen. Um, uh, what are the intentions? You know, what constitutes good or bad? And so we were able to sort of leverage expert partner dancers to kind of ask this question in a, in a more con controlled way. So this is the robot in action. This is Madeline's first time interacting with the robot that responds just to the forces that are applied to the limbs. Um, and uh, so its, it's, it's wheels sort of respond to the uh, forces that it's, that it's sensing at, at the hands. So we had to turn this into a, an experiment, which is which much simpler than the sort of movements that you're seeing here, but to get principles that we think would generalize to these other movements. So this is me trying, oh, it's called a, a crossover break. Um, um, so we, a lot of times with the robots, it's like, oh, yeah, it worked. And we wanted to know what is good, not just it was able to happen, Ma mainly because humans are super adaptable, and so they, they can make it work. Um, we brought in expert dancers with a lot of partner dance experience as well as instruction. We had them walk forward and backwards with this robot. They were blindfolded, so there is no vision. So everything is happening with these hands. And then we asked them about you know, different, like what, did the robot understand what, where I wanted to go? You know, where, was it falling well or not? And then compared it to sort of objective biomechanical measures, which could, could help us not have to ask a, a questionnaire after every single trial. <laughs> which is what we did. And so this is, uh, uh, I'll just go quickly through this, but this is sort of the person going backwards and forwards in space. And this is the speed of the person's going backwards, forward and backwards. And these are the forces at, at the hands, hands and defectors. And you can see they're about 20 newtons, which is maybe two cans of corn, um, something like that. So they're really, they're really small. So 
we were able to show certain subjective experience were related to certain bio, biomechanical measures, so the lag time um, really corresponded to it understood where I wanted it to go. Um, and smaller interaction forces were more desirable, meaning it, it understood me well. Um, and we were doing great, and then we said, okay, is this what people do? And the question, the answer was, we have no idea because nobody studied this. As I said, we could find just a few papers on human-human physical interactions. And so, um, so this was more about the robot than people, and so, of course, we had to do another experiment in which we had people actually walking together in the lab looking at um, just based on forces at the hands. And in this case, the leader has a beat, the follower doesn't because they're like the robot. And we're measuring forces at the hand and they're able to walk together. So we have this as a predictable step. We also had them learn this unpredictable pseudo-random step that our leaders had to learn. So this is a very simple question, but let's see, can I go forward? Um, here's some, some, some interesting results. We brought in partner dance experts and novices. And in the, in the unpredictable steps, it was like really weird back and forth. Whole body synchronization is how well were they coordinated. You can see the experts improved over time. So the differences between one person's movement and the others reduced over time. Um, the experts paired with novices didn't improve, which was really interesting. And the novices together improved some. The experts over time were increasing the magnitude of their forces and generally used higher forces than the novices who were decreasing their amount of forces over time. So we think that these forces, again, they're not very high. They're not, they're not pushing you. They're really communication channel of cues and the experts are like trying to be more understood and give a clearer communication channel than the novices. Um, and then we think that the novices and the experts are just mismatched. They're just, they can't understand each other. Um, so with that, you know, our goal, we're continuing with some experiments now to, to try and use physical human-human interactions in, in GATE to um, sort of build a dictionary of force interactions that we could implement on a, on a robot and, and start with some EEG to see like are, when, are these forces perceived as a perturbation like in my first thing or as a guidance signal, and there may be some brain signatures of that. So with that, I'm going to end and say, if you're from Emory, I actually um, just got this um, Emory Synergy Nexus II Award to, whose title is Automated Analysis of Individual Specific Walking Patterns in Health and Disease, and here's some ideas of what we want to do to actually get out into the wild as they go into the clinic, go into the dance class. I would love to talk to a, a anthropologists, sociologists, but we're just getting the tools to be able to be able to do this. And this is a faculty impact form we're, we're going to propose. So if you're interested, please, please contact me. All right. Thank you. So it could be that different postures, but in terms of like how they're joining and we're changing, we didn't see any appreciable differences. Okay. Because um, with the narrow beam, it really defines where you have to place your leg. Yeah. And so, as I said, from kinematically, we don't see a lot. That may be just because our measurements aren't that great, because you can see these differences, but still people are doing generally um, the same thing. The differences are probably really subtle, um, but when they're able to do it, they look fairly similar, yeah. but the underlying motor patterns are different. Right. I have a question about uh, the surfaces that human beings have explored in your experiments. If you did the same sort of experiments on a lot more rougher surfaces, a lot rougher surfaces, would you get similar sort of results? Would you get delayed learning or more like faster learning in the license of experts? Not really so by 
Uh, so if we did surfaces, you, you would have to be walking, right? So I, I don't usually like to study walking. So we have the <laughs> balancing. But if you had a squishier surface, then it would be, it would be different. Um, there are people studying sort of walking over rough terrains, softer terrains, and things like that. And it does change how you walk. And uh, depending on the, how well your sensory, motor, your sensory system works, um, some things are uh, going to be more difficult than others. So, so we have tests where we make uh, the ground squishy. People stand on foam. It's a clinical test. And what it means is it takes out the sort of proprioceptive information in your ankles, and you have to rely on vision and uh, vestibular information. So uh, if you have people close their eyes, this is now a diagnostic test for vestibular disorders. So it kind of <coughs> tells you what kind of... Uh, uh, problems you might have, so sensory information that you're, you're lacking or maybe not, not using as much. So changing the surface which can, can be quite diagnostic um, and they require different strategies that you can study, but we haven't, we haven't done it explicitly. Yeah, I kind of wanted to follow on the, the question Enrique asked about the, the individual differences. Uh, they, and you're seeing uh, people solving the same task, but very differently in terms of the and I was surprised that it's even the, the experts that they haven't converged on, on more similar ways of solving it. Um, is there any kind of like uh, movement, like if you've specifically been coached to do it a particular way, is there any kind of training that actually gets people to solve these problems using the same muscle modules? Or is it irreducibly just because we have different bodies, you have to solve it differently? So you don't have to solve it differently. We don't look at muscle activation patterns because it's really hard. Um, and there are uh, many different muscles that can be combined different ways to produce the same trajectories. Um, and then beyond that, different trajectories to produce the same action. So muscle is not something that people have really looked at. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to interpret. But if you look at like pitchers, people have done this. They all have a slightly different style. And um, you know, the coaching kind of best practices is like don't mess with that style. Um, but focus on the goal, which is like how fast is your hand moving at the end. The example that I give in one of the papers is that changing those really basic sort of preferred movement patterns is very difficult. It's something we have to do in rehabilitation. It's something that Tiger Woods tried to do in changing the nature of his swing. And it took him years before he was able to win another uh, major tournament because you basically have to break it down and get worse before you get better again and we learn this pattern. So the idea is that these are pretty low level and you'll recombine these patterns to do different tasks. Um, so it, it, it takes a lot of, of effort to kind of change those and you have to be highly motivated uh, to be able to do that. Now, maybe I don't really understand, uh, oh, I know I don't understand dance, uh, but, but I mean, so the examples you're giving in which there's sort of a, a, an objective, these are instrumental actions and transitive actions, you know, there's a success metric of moving the ball or not, but in some things, it's, it's reproducing the motion is the goal, right? I think in dance or, or not, maybe certainly in like sign language or something like that, yep. where it's communicative. Yeah, so you'll see when you, people dance, they're not really all doing the same things, and there are these properties that we really can't measure in biomechanics, but I think a lot of it has to do with how the muscles are activated, um, where the movements aren't really the same. They have different quality, they have uh, slightly different motions. And, and the only, how do I learn that? I learn it through vision. So these things aren't directly learned by like, moving my arm in these particular ways. So it's really my interpretation of how to achieve what I see. And, and so um, this is a crazy like cognitive motor loop, right? And that involves perception too. And um, I was at a conference and motor control people like, do you really think people perform an action and they think they did it one way, but they really didn't? And my thought was, you're motor control scientist. Have you ever taken a sport dance, anything? Because that's very clear to me. I've done a lot of coaching. Of, uh, sports where I'm like, okay, do this. And I'm like, okay, okay, lift your elbow. I did lift my elbow. No, you didn't actually. You lifted it higher than you normally do, but that's not. So all of these things I really, I think, affect how we perceive others' movements, like what we're paying attention to, and how we perceive our own movements uh, as well as produce them. Wait, yes. So just to follow up on this, where are these preferred movements? 
strat you know movement strategies coming from? Are they partly due to sort of mechanical or structural differences, or you know, so why do we all walk differently? I mean, so there are um, there are probably some structural differences, um, and when you like kick in the womb, you're you're learning these things. But we've done modeling studies on musculoskeletal models that have lots of muscles. And so there's no difference in the biomechanics. And, and that was sort of that Karen Liu study. Right. That simulation had the same biomechanical structure. Right. So what she did was just change, tweak the ways in which the, the joints were controlled. And we've, we've shown that that space is really large. So if there's some randomness to how you learned how to, you know, when, right, right. if you think about like motor battling right. and kids reaching, they're going to get something that works. And that is somewhat random. Right. And then from that random starting point, you then um, start to improve. And if you start randomly here, you might get stuck over here. And if you start randomly with a solution here, you might get stuck there. With some training, you might try to move from one to the other. So it's a little bit of randomness. It's right. the fact that there's lots of ways to solve the problem. And then it has to do with where does your training then push you? Right. Training. Remember, movement also conveys a lot of other right. things, right? right? So it's meaningful. it's meaningful. We know you can get socioeconomic status, confidence, emotion. Um, all of these things are embedded in movements in ways that like biomechanists don't even consider, but there's there's a lot of s social communication that happens honestly that, that probably drives a lot of it as well. Um, so related to that and the mood, that was really interesting, the animation of the mood, but have you thought about incorporating any state and trait-like variables of mood and arousal, you know, um, alertness into the individual differences like the accents to see if it changes from person? We, I didn't even know about this stuff before we were doing that work, but um, we, with our EEG studies now, we have state trait anxiety, we have arousal, all, all of those things, and uh, so we're showing the way that people kind of process this perturbation is, depends on how bad their balance is, basically, <laughs> um, and also related to their, uh, not sure if we're getting a significant effect, but anxiety we don't definitely plays into that, which clinically, which, it, you know, it, it, people are afraid of falling, and that um, can affect things. Question? Uh, some talks yesterday spoke about uh, some in social environment uh, shared or synchronized um, brain activity. Uh, do you think this is completely speculative? That, for instance, you spoke about the Parkinson people benefiting from tango dancing by getting some tactile cues. Do you think that performing certain motor activity in a group session for Parkinson people so that they get some visual cues might be helpful therapeutically as well? So when you do the dance, there's a lot of factors, and it's very hard to reduce it down to one, and probably not that useful to reduce it down to one, but um, I do know that with the Parkinson's, participating in a group activity is really important because people feel valued and they find some of them have really not talked to other people with Parkinson's with the same issue. So we, we know that that's an issue. Madeline is controlled for that in the studies because they, uh, by having a control group that does an educational program and they meet together. So it's more than just that. Um, there's a music aspect, which we know activates sort of automatic, more automatic types of mechanisms. There's the interaction with people that probably has some hormonal oxytocin type of effect. Um, and, but uh, a lot of this is being in a safe environment with another person and then practicing skills that are somewhat challenging. So along with the exercise that it helps, it's also challenging people to learn. So we think that they may be sculpting their modules in, in doing this. And the whole environment of it just makes it more amenable for people to kind of learn, want to learn, want to come back, um, and to do that. So the social aspect is there. We can't say specifically 
what it is. In a lot of cases, people are looking and they're not as connected with their bodies. And so a lot of times we actually tell them to close their eyes. Close your eyes, feel, your, you know, feel what you're trying to do because that's sort of a bottom-up control that is sort of lost, so there's more automatic control. Uh, and they're compensating with this sort of, let me think about how to move. Most of us, we don't think about how we walk, we don't think about how we balance. And so our idea is to try and get it out of the brain, back down into <laughs> the spinal cord and the, and the brainstem where, where it should be. 